the White House is set to unveil their new executive order on artificial intelligence as early as next Monday. Welcome back to the AI Breakdown. There is something of a crescendo right now in the first wave of global AI policy. Ever since the emergence of ChatGPT, governments around the world have, of course, been getting slowly more serious about this technology. Now, for some, like the European Union, those efforts had already been underway, and the rise of generative AI was simply a catalyst to finally get things done. In other jurisdictions, in places like China, artificial intelligence has long been not only on their policy minds, but a very direct and specific strategic priority. However, in some places, notably here in the U.S., the rise of this new wave of tools has required a very fast effort, basically from a standing start, for politicians at the congressional, senate, and executive level. The push to regulate these technologies has gotten even more acute in the wake of the rise of the AI safety conversation prompted by a number of factors this year, including the six-month pause letter, Jeffrey Hinton's defection from Google to try to raise awareness of the risks of AI, and just generally the lobbying effort to make U.S. politicians aware of what some of the more sci-fi-sounding implications of this technology might actually be. A few months ago, the White House really started to pick up their efforts in this area. They began by inviting a notable group of CEOs from the AI space to a White House meeting that was chaired by Vice President Kamala Harris and which President Biden stopped by, which was also notable at the time for not including Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg. And subsequent to that meeting, we've gotten drips and drabs of information about what the White House is likely to try to do on this topic. Well, now, according to reporting from The Washington Post, the White House is planning to unveil their much-anticipated AI executive order next Monday. So what's the information we have so far about what is likely to be in this EO? One interesting piece of this is that there is a clear lead-by-example attempt. In other words, while it doesn't appear, at least as of yet, that the executive order will impose mandates around assessments that happen before models can be released generally, it does appear that they're going to require advanced AI models to have assessments before they can actually be used by federal workers. This is both an update to the federal procurement process, as well as a way to use that process as an evaluation tool for these advanced models. Now, in order to help different departments figure out how to use these technologies, federal agencies like the Defense Department and the Energy Department would be required to conduct their own assessments to figure out how AI could help their different mandates and improve the way their agencies function. It sounds as if there will be a specific focus in those assessments on how AI can help bolster national cyber defenses. Now, speaking of bolstering, the executive order is also anticipated to ease barriers to immigration for highly skilled workers. This will be a very welcome update if it actually comes through to those who think that the U.S.'s immigration policies have put us at a strategic disadvantage relative to something that was once our huge advantage in terms of assimilating the world's greatest talent into our scientific establishment. The fact that that's part of the direction also suggests just how much the specter of geopolitical competition, particularly with China, looms large over this particular executive order and the topic that it touches. Now, the way that the Post found out about this was that they saw an invite to an event called the Safe, Secure, and Trustworthy Artificial Intelligence event. The White House declined to formally comment, but the Washington Post sources said that the order had actually not been finalized, so details or even plans for timing could change. I think that probably the most interesting thing here, and the piece that people will be watching most closely, is exactly what this assessment process for governments using LLMs is going to be. The Post writes that this red teaming is expected to be led by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Earlier this year, that body released a framework for managing AI risks, and it is already collaborating with other agencies on this topic. Now, in terms of precedent of using U.S. government purchasing power as a way to influence the shape of a field, the Post points to a 2021 cybersecurity executive order from the Commerce Department as an example of how that had worked in the past. Now, of course, the White House is far from the only game in town, even in Washington. Earlier in the week, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer hosted a second AI Insight Forum, which brought back a number of people from both the tech side, including notably Mark Andreessen, as well as from the academia side and the safety side of the equation, including Max Tegmark. And the goal, of course, of these forums is to help politicians in D.C. get up to speed more quickly so that when they go about the work of regulating the artificial intelligence space, they actually have a firmer understanding of what's going on underneath. On top of that, there are numerous attempts to bring together more comprehensive AI legislation, as well as a huge number of smaller AI legislative efforts. So lots going on in Washington. Meanwhile, over in Brussels, while the EU had been lauded for moving more quickly than some of its peers in passing its comprehensive legislation in the form of the AI Act, it's having trouble getting the details right in practice. 
Earlier this week, The Verge posted an article called EU May Fail to Pass Its AI Act in 2023. European lawmakers can't agree on how to regulate foundation models. So basically, the way that this legislative process works is that after the act is voted in principle, it goes through a set of debates and discussions around specific implementation details. These are called trilogues, which are three-party discussions between the European Parliament, the Council of the European Union, and the European Commission. And there have been three around the AI Act so far, with a fourth happening this week. Another provisional meeting has been set up for December if the parties aren't able to agree on things this month. Now, one piece of the AI Act requires that foundation model developers, so think the open AIs of the world, be required to assess risks, do more extensive testing throughout the development process as well as red teaming, examine biases in training data, and just basically imposes a set of processes around these tools in order to try to drag them to a safer place. Now, one of the contentious issues is that the way that it's framed is sort of a dragnet that will catch up not just the big companies that have the budgets and the time for compliance, but also smaller open source projects, which A, aren't really the main concern that's trying to be addressed here, and B, don't necessarily have the resources to actually comply. The battle then is to get the rules to reflect the diversity of projects in the space and have a better or clearer articulation of how different rules apply to those different types of foundation models. Now, on top of the open source question, there's also just other disagreements about specific implementation details. It sounds like from Reuters reporting that Spain, who holds the EU presidency currently, has been trying to push through compromises that would have a tiered approach for regulating foundation models, which have 45 million users or more, as well as additional obligations for what they call very capable foundation models that includes regular testing for potential vulnerabilities. Apparently, there are opponents of those plans that think that smaller platforms can be just as risky. Now, of course, part of the context for all of this is the upcoming AI Safety Summit in the UK next week. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak actually held a speech this morning discussing the issues underlying that event. In that speech, Sunak did acknowledge the potential for society to lose control over AI with potentially cataclysmic results. He also discussed other risks including heightened cyber attacks, more advanced fraud, child sexual abuse, and potential changes to the labor force. He discussed the capacity of AI to be used by terrorist groups, quote, to spread fear and disruption on an even greater scale. He said, as The Independent summed up, that human extinction risk from AI is on the same scale as pandemics or nuclear war, and that we shouldn't put our heads in the sand when it comes to these issues. At the same time, he said, the opportunities are immense, and this speech really laid a lot of that out. He talked about how much potential AI had to catalyze economic growth and to enhance productivity. And he said that he was generally optimistic about the potential of AI to transform people's lives for the better. When it comes to regulation, on the one hand, the prime minister was very clearly trying to put UK in a leadership seat on these issues. But he also said that they would be in no, quote, rush to regulate AI because, as he put it, it's hard to regulate something you do not fully understand. Now, of course, perhaps the biggest issue surrounding the summit is the decision to invite China to participate. This was initially controversial in the UK, in part because of a Chinese spying scandal that was happening at the same time that the summit was being announced. Beyond that, of course, there is just a sense that when it comes particularly to artificial intelligence, the West and China are much more competitors than collaborators. Even though, of course, to look at cutting-edge research is to see a very different story. Sunak took those concerns head on, saying that it wasn't an easy decision to invite China, but that it was, in his words, the right thing to do, because the threats and opportunities of AI are too big to have balkanized strategy across the world. Now, in his speech, the British Prime Minister said that he wasn't sure if China was actually even going to attend. However, Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden said that China had accepted the invitation. He told the BBC, It is the case they've accepted, but we will wait to see everyone who actually turns up at the summit. As things stand, yes, we do expect them to come. Meanwhile, there had been some concern that there was a growing wave of leaders who were deciding not to attend, potentially minimizing the significance of the event. But at least when it comes to the U.S.'s participation, whatever concerns they might have had behind the scenes around the China invite, they decided to get over them and Vice President Kamala Harris is still expected to attend as had been the plan. Indeed, given the timing of this executive order, it's pretty clear that the White House is trying to align or perhaps even assert themselves in the context of this UK event where that government is obviously trying to position themselves as leaders as well. The one thing that is for sure is that next week will be a big one for AI global policy. And of course, I will bring you all of the updates as they happen here on the AI Breakdown. Until next time, guys. Peace.